Hi, now we're looking at week eight, and we're looking at substance abuse and substance related disorders. Now this first video, I'm gonna look at the sort of categories, and it's a little bit different than some of the other psychological disorders in that most of us have probably been familiar with people who have used different drugs, you know, marijuana, uh, hashish, alcohol, nicotine, but also some other things potentially, other hallucinogens and stimulants and uh, depressants. And it doesn't seem right in a sense to categorize it as a disorder, a psychological disorder. But what we're gonna be looking at and want you to pay attention to that each and every single one of these in and of themselves, you might say, well, you know, everybody does this or it's not a big deal. But the key is around looking at psychological dependency and physiological dependency. Now the difference between somebody using and somebody abusing, you have to fall back on what we talked about in the very first week around what makes up a psychological disorder. You know, it's somehow damaging to themselves, it puts them at risk, um, it affects their everyday life. And so people who come to be in this category are using to the point of those sort of check marks being checked off. And so this is not the same as somebody going out for a drink or somebody who um, engages in some narcotic drugs periodically. This is different. This is somebody who uses to the point where it interferes with their everyday life, their relationships, their ability to do their work, the ability to engage in social activities, maybe even to the point of risking their health, and it involves the psychological and physiological dependency. So that's what we're gonna do in, in the first one. I'm not gonna go into great detail. A lot of it is in your textbook around the, you know, what it is and what they do, you know, in terms of the different drugs. And you've probably in your course of your education through high school have heard the do's and the don'ts of different drugs and such. So I won't go in great detail. Any other detail that you may want to get in terms of clarification, please look in your textbook. Alrighty, let's get on with it. The DSM uses two major categories for substance related disorders. Okay, now there is um, a substance use disorder, which is the number one substance abuse disorder. And it's patterns of maladaptive behavior involving the use of psychoactive substances. And the substance, abuse, uh, substance use disorder includes substance abuse disorder and substance dependence disorder. And so when we look at this, it, con it, continues, it, it continued to use the psychoactive uh, drug despite the knowledge that it can cause or is contributing to a persistent and reoccurrent social, occupational, psychological, and physical problems that in spite of knowing this, we carry it on. And that's what a substance use disorder is. Now the second type is known as substance induced disorder. And here the disorder is induced by the use of psychoactic, uh, psychoactive substances. This includes intoxication, withdrawal syndromes, mood disorders, delirium, and amnesia. Now along this line are with substances, there is what's called intoxication. This is a state of drunkenness or being high. So what intoxication will look like really, really depends on the substance being used, the dosage of that substance, and the person's reactivity and to some degree the user's expectations. Extreme intoxication can lead to death. Substance use disorder may continue over a long period and can progress to more severe, um, significant, more se severe progression, even to feeling helpless to control their use. Now you'll find on page 250 in table 7.2, the criteria for alcohol use disorder. Now there are some basic elements or hallmarks of substance abuse and there are physiological reactions to prolonged use of substances leading to the development of tolerance and withdrawal, which are two big um, issues when it comes to um, substance abuse. 
The top three commonly used drugs in North America are tobacco, about 25% of the population, alcohol, about 15% of the population, and marijuana, about 5% of the population in North America. Now tolerance, this is the physical habituation of any substance, drug or alcohol, with frequent use and the use of higher doses which are needed to achieve the same effect as had been before on fewer and less. The other uh, term that's associated with um, the other sort of component is that of withdrawal syndrome. And withdrawal syndrome uh, has the characteristics when the person stops abruptly from a substance after they have been using it for long periods of time in heavy use. The symptoms uh, will vary according to the substance being abused. In alcohol uh, abuse, it will include nausea, weakness, and what is known as uh, tachycardia. Norm it's this abnormally rapid heart rate increases the likelihood of anxiety and depression and insomnia and in some cases withdrawal will include um, delirium tremens no one has DTs and delirium which is essentially disorientation and co incoherent speech and so these are typical of substance abuse in terms of criteria or for expectations of the experience over longer period of use some other terms that are important to know um, of course is addiction. Uh, people define addiction in different ways. Uh, for our purposes we're going to define it as the habitual or compulsive use of a drug accompanied by evidence of physiological dependence. Now there's some key points there. Habitual just means habit forming. It's like getting up in the morning and lighting a cigarette. When you're a smoker you know what I mean. Well, in this case, it's with other substances, not, not excluding to uh, tobacco, but it becomes that habitual, you know, the after meal, the later in the evening, the before you go to bed, they become habit forming in terms of time or place, circumstances, or with people. The compulsive use is the, if I don't get this now, I will, it's, it's preoccupying my thoughts and it becomes something that if I don't satisfy those thoughts, it becomes very anxiety producing. Now, the major signs of addiction include uh, signs of physiological dependence. This involves the development of tolerance and or uh, a, a withdrawal syndrome, abstinence syndrome. So physiological dependence becomes where your body is in need of it. It's not any different really that when you're thirsty and you're really thirsty, your body starts to cry out. You get a dry mouth. Your body and your mind starts to think about, well, this is what I'm missing. I need, so you need to go get. And it's a physiological dependence in this instance that the substance that you're missing becomes something that you hurt for, if you will. The other side of the dependence is that of psychological dependence. It's involving the pattern of compulsive use associated with impair, impaired control over the use of the drug. And these are two things to really keep in mind. Well, actually, these and the um, other hallmarks mentioned in the previous slide are things to remember when looking at substance abuse as a psychological disorder. Now, there's different pathways to this sort of dependency. Experimentation is probably one that we're familiar with. This is the occasional use, the temporary feel good. The, feel, the user feels like they're in control and believes they can stop at any time. And a lot of the time that's in fact the case. Over time, experimentation can lead to more routine use. Lives begin to be structured around the pursuit of or the use of drugs. Uh, denial plays a big role here, you know, oh no, no, I could stop any time and you're using it on a daily and daily uh, daily basis. You may even begin to cover up and saying, well, no, that wasn't something I did today. That was from last week, you know. Things that were once important, things like family and work, they are less so. You might even miss certain meetings or you might not attend work because of the routine use and the side effects of those routine uses. The choices are dominated by drugs, spending, 
uh, spending on the time related to drugs and alcohol, straining relationships with family and friends, and unexplained absences. And for a smaller group of people, experimentation to routine use can lead towards addiction or dependence. Once a routine user feels less powerful, in fact, feels powerless to resist the drugs, either for the effects that the drugs give or to avoid the experience of withdrawal. So drug abuse carried on, we can look at some types. We're gonna start with depressants. Now, depressants usually include alcohol, sedatives, minor tranquilizers, and opiates. So when we think in terms of, you know, alcohol is a very common one, the effects of alcohol intoxication uh, includes intoxication, impaired coordination, slurred speech, the impaired intellectual um, functioning. Now, there are, there are, uh, if you will, it's associated with this risk factors to alcohol. Now, one of the first that's often looked at in terms of the demographics in any particular area that you're looking at in regards to alcohol would be gender. And interestingly, when it comes to alcohol equity, there's a fairly equal um, distribution between men and women in the use of alcohol. Um, women tend to start later, but alcohol, um, alcoholism moves more quickly for women. Another factor is that of age. Young adult, before 40, uh, the beginning in late adolescence and somewhat later for women tends to have a higher risk. Antisocial personality disorder has an impact. Uh, family history, uh, is best predictor for problem drinking in adulthood, um, by example, that is to say that when we see drinking around us as children, we become more, uh, we can see it as a social experience that can be um, modeled, or perhaps some biological uh, predisposition could be occurring. Also, there's the um, sort of sociodemographic or the areas around social experience. There's an increased risk of alcohol use among people with lower income and with lower levels of education. Now again, this doesn't mean that everybody in these circumstances are automatically at higher risk, but these are the demonstrated risk factors when it comes to use of alcohol. Conceptions of alcohol, I'll start with you know, the medical model where it views alcoholism as a disease. It's permanent, it's irreversible, Essentially, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Now there's a historic perspective that introduces it as a moral defect. I think we, could, uh, uh, we can find that research has suggested that that's not a strong position to hold anymore. There is also a behavioral sort of component to this and that is the self-fulfilling prophecy. Now if we look at some of the other effects like psychology or the psych psychology effects, we have the stereotypical alcohol will reduce the tensions and the worries. You know, if you're a tense person or you worry a lot in a social situation, well, alcohol will make it more relaxed. The increased pleasure in social interactions, in fact, can be more detrimental. The notion around short-term pleasure being more accepted in a social environment can bring about long-term pain and that it could turn into a routine use and perhaps even uh, addiction and dependency. Chronic alcohol abuse has been connected with uh, disorders such as alcohol-induced persisting amnesic disorder, which is also known as uh, Korsakoff um, syndrome, cirrhosis of the liver and other physical disorders, and along with fetal alcohol syndrome associated in terms of some of the um, other physical effects. Now, can somebody moderately drink? Well, the simple answer is, as pointed out there, is yes, but. It's a slippery slope. Yes, there is some research that supports moderate drinking and it has some guidelines around how much alcohol per, you know, per day could be reasonable. The risk, of course, is any of the you know, other associations that we'll start to make in regards to risks of alcohol abuse. Alcohol plays a role in the deaths due to snowmobile accidents. About 77% of the cases, alcohol is involved. Homicides, over 50% of the cases. Traffic accidents, over 40% of the cases. 
voting accidents, about 40% of the cases, and suicides, about 20% of the cases. We'll look at barbiturates next. Now, barbiturates are depressants or sedatives that have been used medically for the relief of anxiety or short-term insomnia, among other uses. They can uh, become psychologically and, uh, so, uh, and um, psychologically and physiologically dependent on both in terms of tolerance and the development of withdrawal syndrome. Opiates, or they're also known as narcotics, such as morphine and heroin, have, are derived from the poppy, uh, opium poppy. Others are synthesized, and they're used medically to relieve pain. Um, it's known as uh, analgesia, and they are strongly addictive. This image here shows the, you know, the pain signal coming in through the, uh, the neurons and along the brain, in, in the brain cells uh, in the brain, and then looking at how the endorphins, which are the things that can help block those pain signals, will move into uh, stimulants. These increase the activity in the neural system. Now, amphetamines, cocaine is among and the stimulants as well, increase the availability of neurotransmitters in the brain. Heightening states of arousal. High doses can produce an amphetamine psychosis, which mimics features of paranoid schizophrenia. Cocaine, it's produced from cocoa leaves. It can be snorted as a powder. Uh, it can be injected as a liquid, uh, usually used through a, a process called freebasing and the use of ether, or it's, it can be smoked in a hardened form called crack. Cocaine produces a high but stimulating, uh, produces a high by stimulating the neurotransmitter dopamine, resulting in high blood pressure, accelerated heart rate, and reduced blood flow to the heart Overdose includes, overdose, uh, overdosing can include insomnia, restlessness, nausea, tremors, hallucinations, even death. Now, another form of stimulant is nicotine. The repeated use of nicotine, usually in the form of cigarette smoking, can lead to physiological uh, dependence. And if you look on page 266, figures 7.2 and 7.3, uh, you'll see some charts associated with stimulants. If we move into hallucinogens, also known as psychedelics, including LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline, other drugs um, with similar effects are cannabis, also known as marijuana, and PCB, uh, phenicillocidin. If we look at LSD as an example, as one of the um, hallucinogens, um, it appears to decrease the serotonin action and increase dopamine activity. Now, one of the results that can occur for some people are what are known as flashbacks or the re-experiencing of some of the distortions from a past trip that happened days, months, or even years earlier. They are sudden and they are a result of chemical changes in the brain. Uh, PCP uh, began its life in the 50s and as, as an anesthesiac. Uh, it was discontinued when it was discovered its hallucinatory effects on patients. It's very unpredictable. The effects, um, the effects are very unpredictable, which can be very, um, which can vary in terms of uh, increased heart rate, uh, blood pressure is also increased, but it's also capable of producing states of delirium. And marijuana, which is a psychoact, which has a psychoactive ingredient THC, the pr the proportion of marijuana users in Canada is much higher among uh, young adults in the population as a whole. Dependence is associated with a psychological and physiological dependence. Now, hashish is also derivative of marijuana from the marijuana resin, and has a very similar uh, experience to marijuana. Inhalants. Many substances can be used that produce fumes, adhesives, 
uh, aerosols, cleaning fluids, fuels, many others. These are inhaled and can induce feelings of intoxication and euphoria uh, by their actions on the gamma, uh, the GABA, the GABA, and dopamine systems. The psychological and physical effects of inhalants can be very serious and even with, um, can be fatal with just one use. Now this has been an overview of the types of drugs that can produce substance-related psychological disorders. They're not limited to these, and certainly if you're, um, you've been through in your high school career, I'm sure, a lot of seminars or workshops on the um, risks of drugs and alcohol. Um, this would be more of the extreme risks associated with drugs and alcohol. All right, let's carry on and we'll go to um, video two, which we'll look at theories, and then video three, we'll look at treatments. Thank you, everybody. Bye now.